I'm Mina al Arabi, Editor-in-Chief of The National, and I'm at the residence of the Ambassador of France to the UAE, Xavier Chatel, for this episode of The Art of Diplomacy. We'll be talking about what it takes to be a successful diplomat, UAE-French relations, and the latest developments in diplomacy. Your Excellency, thank you so much for making the time to speak to me. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you as a guest on The Art of Diplomacy. And I wanted to start by asking you, what makes a successful diplomat? I think a successful diplomat first is someone who tackles all issues. When you're working in an embassy, there's no minor subject. So when I look back in the last two years that I've been here, we've been handling defense issues. We've been working with the schools. We've been striking major um, cultural deals. We've been promoting the economy and striking you know, really important um, deals and contracts in many fields. We've been also handling policy, foreign policy, representation, etc. And you need to be able to tackle all of these things. So that would be the, the first thing. Second, I think you need to be steady when the going gets rough. And I have two examples that sprang to mind. When uh, I arrived here, um, a few months into my uh, stay here, we had to evacuate 2,800 people from Afghanistan in what looked pretty much like a, a military slash humanitarian operation. And you need to be able, really, with no uh, notice, to organize this. Um, and another example is when the UAE was attacked in uh, January of uh, this year um, with the missiles. You know, we were able to respond very, very rapidly. And that was also very much crisis mode. And you have to be able to handle that kind of situation. But the last thing, and it's an advice that a very dear friend of mine who's a very seasoned ambassador gave me, is you have to not take yourself too seriously. <laughs> that's great advice. Because, I mean, that's part of the, the dilemma, the challenge. There is such an important role in the people-to-people -people relationship, but there's also very serious issues at stake. So how do you not take yourself too seriously? The bottom line is, you're a normal person. You have to work with normal persons. You have to run an organization that needs to be interested, motivated, uh, that needs to um, do the stuff. And um, you can't do it if you're aloof or uh, if you, are, uh, you have too high an opinion of yourself. So I really believe in um, you know, being with your team, part of the team. And same thing I would say with the leadership of the country. I think people detect immediately when you are trying to uh, be someone you're not. So it's better to be uh, what you are. You talked about the Afghanistan evacuation and that being quite a critical moment, of course, for the people of Afghanistan, geopolitically, but also the evacuation. And so you had quite the operation to oversee. Uh, tell us a bit more about that. And also, I, I don't think that comes with your usual training as a, as a diplomat or an ambassador. <laughs> Not really. We would need a pretty comprehensive training if we were to be trained for that, too. Uh, but basically what happened is we had overnight to evacuate hundreds of people, altogether 2,800, from Kabul. So they were coming on military flights from Kabul to the air base that we operate in Ad Dafra, near Abu Dhabi. And here we turned the air base into a sort of large-scale refugee camp where we cared for people. We gave them food, treatment, medical attention, um, and also we did consular um, screening and also security screening. And then sometimes they stayed overnight. Uh, sometimes they played football in the hangar of the air base. And then the next day, we would fly them to France with a strategic air flight, slightly more comfortable, but not that comfortable. And then they were uh, in France and then they could be processed by the immigration service um, and you know, go on living uh, basically as refugees in, uh, in France. And that was a, a very hectic operation because we needed to put together all these different kinds of services, consular, medical, food. We even had sometimes to give them shoes. Children were arriving with bare feet. And so we found ways through the generosity of embassy personnel to uh, find shoes for them or sometimes clothes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a big operation and one which is also emotionally very taxing because the, um, the state in which some of the people arrived was sometimes very uh, extremely moving. 
Diplomacy is also changing with technology, with the speed of, of how we not only communicate, but even meet people. You know, I think people are creating communities by social networks and so forth. How do you think the role of the ambassador is changing with the changes in technology? So it's a, it's a debate which started a long time ago because with the invention of the telephone, lots of ambassadors were in an existential crisis. Uh, and we found out that diplomacy is uh, every bit as needed now as it was uh, back then. And um, you know this even became part of art history with a famous uh, phone invented by Dali, which had the shape of a lobster. Um, so, and, and we're facing today the, the uh, uh, current evolutions of this. And now we're moving to WhatsApp, we're moving to Slack for some of us, we're moving to different types of uh, networks, uh, etc. We're using lots of social networks, uh, Instagram, TikTok even for some ambassadors, etc. Uh, and still, the COVID has shown that there is still a big appetite for personal contact, that you need to establish the trust through the human interaction. Nothing will replace a hug, a look, a gesture. Um, and just the, the, all the things that this very sophisticated machine called the human being is able to sense in the actual contact with people and does, doesn't come across in Zoom or Slack or WhatsApp. All this is needed and I would say if you take the opposite of this argument, when people become um, you know, isolated, uh, like for instance the, uh, the Russian president is at the moment, it's a dangerous situation. Now, I want to ask you about how you became ambassador. How did you end up representing France here in Abu Dhabi? So I was interested by diplomacy from the outset because I liked uh, for international affairs, because I liked traveling, because I liked languages, uh, and also because of a reflection on history. I've always been um, meditating on what happened to Europe in uh, the interwar period and on the string of decisions that led um, Europe to undergo the terrible catastrophes of the, uh, second, of the uh, 20th century. And that really made me think, in my century, when we are going to face the dilemmas that we will have at that time, there will be different history, it doesn't repeat itself uh, in, um, exact, uh, in an exact way. When we face these challenges, I would like to contribute, even in a minor way, uh, with possibly with uh, judgment and with experience, to how we handle them. And then how, I, how did I become ambassador to the UAE? So I'd worked on many things which were basically circling around the UAE. So even before becoming a diplomat, I had worked with Total, and of course oil and gas is an important part of uh, what this country is doing. Um, I've worked on the Iran nuclear file in the UN Security Council, which is also very relevant uh, for uh, this region. Um, and later, I was working as the advisor to the defense minister. And uh, of course, defense is part of what we do with the UAE. And in that capacity, I've come several times and had the big chance of uh, meeting with uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed on several occasions with the defense minister. So I was circling around until um, I was uh, lucky enough to be appointed by President Macron to represent France in this country. So you've worked on various files. We've talked about some of the moments that were really critical um, during your tenure here as ambassador. But tell us about some of the standout memories that you have from being here. So I mentioned, of course, the evacuation. The evacuation of the Afghans was a, a big moment. But I would like also to mention um, Expo. So Expo was a very unusual moment. I had already been ambassador, sorry, not ambassador, diplomat in London when there was the Olympic Games. So I had seen what it means when you have like a huge international event happening over weeks in a place that brings the attention of the entire planet on the place. Well, that's what happened during these uh, six months from uh, October to March in, in Expo, Expo Dubai. It was um, very well run. It was pretty impressive. Uh, beautiful um, event and of course for us as an embassy it generated a noria of ministerial visits of CEOs of companies of uh, other personalities of uh, um, artists uh, people from civil society and of course of the French president who came on the, um, the, the 3rd of December and a presidential visit for an embassy is the moment that you really need to uh, make happen and also which carries the work of the entire team to the next level. 
Now, you mentioned one presidential visit, but you've actually had two presidential visits either way. So it's quite um, a close relationship between the UAE and France, but also in preparing for that and, and what that signifies, having those um, four visits in total. So it's a huge uh, amount of work because each of these things uh, needs to be prepared uh, very intensively. Sometimes you have time to do it, and sometimes it's very short. For instance, when the French president came for uh, the funeral of uh, late Sheikh Khalifa, obviously it was an overnight decision. Um, and the president um, came uh, on the, uh, on the uh, 15th of May, um, if I'm correct. So it was really a very fast decision, almost no preparation, because it was a visit of uh, friendship, condolences, and reaffirming the, the strength of the bond. But when the president came here in December for Expo, of course, we had more preparation. Um, and another very important moment, of course, was when Sheikh Mohammed decided, uh, upon being newly um, appointed as president of the UAE, when he decided to have his first state visit of his entire mandate to France. That was a big gesture of uh, friendship, a big testimony to the strength of the, of the relation. And that was with not so much notice to prepare. So it was a big toll on the teams, but I think it was a big success too. What do you think defines the strength of this relationship between the UAE and France? First of all, I would say consistency. What characterizes this relationship is since the outset, it has been consistently moving up. And it's also a two-way relationship. So when France had difficult moments, for instance, after um, the killing of uh, young professor Samuel Paty, Sheikh Mohammed came out with a very strong, courageous statement supporting France um, in a difficult context. And similarly, when the UAE was attacked in January, France was there. And within days, we had several French aircraft patrolling the skies of the UAE six hours a day against the missile, cruise missile, uh, UAV attacks. And then again, when we started facing vastly disrupted energy markets, the UAE was there for France. And the, we, uh, there was a signature between uh, ADNOC and Total of an agreement with a fuel guarantee, which is quite important uh, in days like the ones we're experiencing now with the uh, terrible Russian aggression against Ukraine. So it's a relationship which is constant, constantly going up and two-way. Now, if you were to describe the UAE to somebody who doesn't know it, so a fellow French citizen who has never been here, how would you describe the UAE? That's not an easy one. Um, I remember uh, General Mattis, who was back then the, uh, the US Defense Secretary, used to, to talk about Little Sparta. And I would take a different view. I would say something like Venice 2.0. <laughs> and let me explain. Um, you're talking about a country which is maybe of modest size, but of a global reach, which has a completely um, uh, international outlook, which is, like Venice at the time, at the hinge between East and West, which is a trading nation um, whose prosperity is related to stability in the region and freedom of navigation in the Gulf, um, which has a logic of trading outposts in its uh, surroundings, which is run by very smart people <laughs> who have both a very strong business acumen, but at the same time, deeply at heart the interest of their nation and their people. And people who are very strategic, who anticipate, who read balance of force, and who are able to navigate a complex uh, international system. So that's what I would say. That's the, I, I have not heard Venice 2.0 before, but I quite like that. That's, that's an interesting take. Um, now, can I ask you, just on a, on a personal level, you know, what do you feel that you've learned from being here? First, humility. 
<laughs> because when you, when you have to work in a place like this, you know you can achieve a lot of things. When I look back in the last two years, um, the number of things that we've done, I was mentioning you know, the, uh, the Afghans, the uh, defense deals, the economic deals, the expo, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is, when you're an ambassador, you're the face of an embassy, but the embassy is doing the work. You're only at the helm, you're only giving directions, you're only motivating, you're only maybe injecting new ideas, new areas of cooperation that you could develop. But the bottom line is it works only if the embassy works. And this you learn really um, you know, on the job. Um, in my case, it's uh, 130 people more or less who work for me, who work with me, I should say. Um, and really, um, that's the only way of getting things done is that people should be happy to go to work in the morning and they think they're doing you know, the right thing for the right purpose. So I would say this. And then, um, working here is a fascinating, um, it's a fascinating point of observation because the UAE is, I think, uniquely placed for a number of things. First, in the Gulf, because it's a, located in a strategic spot in the Gulf where you can see all the changing dynamics and the um, uh, regional evolution. Second, because the UAE is very much plugged on Asia. So if you look at the main trading partners and economic partners of this country, you will find on the top of the list, you will find China, you will find India. So it's a country which is at hinge, but also very much looking east. And I think for people like me who come from Europe, it's really interesting to be in a place which is looking in that direction, despite having very strong uh, links and connections uh, with us. And then it's just the experience of uh, working with uh, world-class, very smart people in uh, not very numerous, because it's uh, not a very large society, but uh, often very impressive. What you bring with you or keep with you that reminds you of home? So the life of ambassador is a life of moving, uh, moving away, moving back sometimes. Um, which is both uh, exhilarating because each time you start again and you start a new life and you will have new friendships and a new job, so it's very exciting. And at the same time, there's always that pinch when you have to leave, you have to put your life in boxes and you have to um, close chapters of your life, which is always a bit ontologically uh, distressing. And in order to, um, in order to accommodate this and uh, to uh, never feel completely um, either you know, lonely or uh, far away. Um, I always have music with me. And in particular, I play, uh, I play the guitar. And so I always have a guitar with me. When I came here, the one thing that I needed, apart from an iron shirt and a, a suit and a tie, was my guitar with really. And the second thing is books. Uh, I'm very much into literature, poetry, um, books. And I uh, always carry with me my books. I have no furniture, I don't bring uh, almost no artwork, etc. but books always. Um, and um, there's one book in particular that has always kept me company throughout my life. It's uh, The Essays of Montaigne, uh, because it's quintessential uh, humanity. So Ambassador, you spoke to us about your guitar mm -hmm. and the, your love of books, but particularly the book that you keep with you. Can you show us them, please? Yes, of course. So this is the guitar. This is beautiful. Where did you get this one from? So actually, I bought this one from Spain, I have to oh. say, from Jerez de la Frontera. Uh, it's a beautiful um, guitar which does both um, classical and flamenco and of course all types of uh, music and this is really when I bring the instrument with me it's both my confidante, uh, my meditation and what makes me feel really that I'm in my home. It's beautiful, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's and beautiful. I love the, 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 rosés. the, the rosés but mm. also it's, it's like um, you know just 
that delicate? Not too much. That's beautiful. Absolutely. So, so you only keep one guitar with you. You don't bring a whole uh, ensemble with you. I do. You do? Really? <laughs> I usually, I usually bring, uh, I usually bring several, and then when I come back to France, sometimes I even change them. You know, I oh. take one, and then I, you know, I want to take another one. The guitars, different guitars are meant for different types of music, and for some types of music, you need guitars which are more percussive. Mm -hmm. In which case, it's better to have guitars whose um, back is made with cypress because it's more reactive. Um, and when you need to have music which is more in uh, depth, uh, more maybe with a uh, rounder tone, it's better to have uh, guitars which are made with rosewood, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is also what usually, normally uh, classical guitars are made of. The sides and the back in rosewood, this dark chocolate colored uh, wood, mm. which has um, amazing sound qualities. That's incredible. Okay, so so I've learned something. Thank you. I did not know that. That's brilliant. And then your gorgeous book. This book is a book that I'm so fond of, Montaigne, the essays. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, so this is an old edition, which I like very much to have with me. But uh, yeah, it's beautiful. And this is, uh, this is the companion. Sometimes the job of a master can be, um, it can be lonely in a sense, because you have to uh, project kindness but also authority um, with the teams that you work with. Um, there's not many people you can confide, confide with mm -hmm. um, and so um, having a, a trusted uh, and immensely wise partner is uh, extremely valuable. Well, thank you very much for sharing that wisdom and your um, home and also your prized possessions with us. Thank you so much for your time, yes. Ambassador. Thank you.